Welcome to Forte Catholic Radio. This is your host, Taylor Schroll. I am recording live from the Red Sea Radio Studios in College Station, Texas. It has been a busy couple of days. I was out of town in Oklahoma City uh, most of last week. Just getting back. Right when I got back, I had to do some ministry stuff Saturday and Sunday. And I've been at work since, so I'm just trying to get through and, and see what we can do here. So, welcome. It is very, very nice to have you in this evening. I want to tell you a little bit about my trip up to Oklahoma City. I went up there for a training institute for work. There's a man named Jim Beckman, who's a fantastic ministry leader who does absolutely amazing work. And he invited me and some of our staff up to, to go through this leadership institute on how to be a better leader within the Catholic Church. So it was, it was a great, great thing. I'm not going to share a lot of, of what we what we talked about, but I do want to share one moment that was absolutely, um, absolutely had an impact on me. We went to go see the Oklahoma City bombing memorial. And I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I was very, very young whenever that happened. And, and we were talking a couple of weeks ago around the anniversary of 9-11. Everybody seems to remember where they were around 9-11. And so that was kind of in my mind as well as we we're traveling to this and trying to figure out, okay, what actually happened at this Oklahoma City bombing? So as we were driving along and heading to, uh, to the bombing memorial, I was looking up the information on what actually happened. So it happened in 1995 in April. So I was five years old. Yeah, I was five years old. I was born in 89, so my birthday hadn't happened yet. So yeah, I was five years old. So I don't remember remember much of this. So we're dr- driving on our, in our cars on the way over there. I start watching a video of what happened. And I knew that it was a truck bombing, but I didn't really know much more than that. I started reading about it on Wikipedia and I watched this video. And both of them are saying that it happened on April 19th, 1995. Timothy McVeigh was the guy who helped create this bomb with his friend Terry Nichols uh, so that they could go blow up this building. And so they did. They, they drove a truck down into the bottom of this, of this federal building in Oklahoma City. And the bombing killed 168 people, injured more than 680 others, and destroyed a third of this building. So as I'm watching this video and trying to see like what happened and try to understand a little bit more, I actually had to stop watching the video because... One thing that I didn't know about it was that there were actually a lot of kids in this building. There was a nursery in the second floor of this building. And I was just absolutely, absolutely angry because I was seeing these, <clears throat> these parents of these kids like, return to the building. And I could just hear the screams of these parents as they were like, trying to find their kids and trying to find whether they made it or not. And it was just absolutely horrifying. So I had to turn it off. I was just absolutely, absolutely angry. And we're, I'm going to keep talking a little bit about that. Like, that's kind of what our show is going to be about today is anger, this tragedy, the death penalty, these types of things, because I, I really was truly angry. And we have this thing that we've heard about called righteous anger, right? Like Jesus in the temple where the temple is is being overrun to sell things instead of um, being what it's supposed to be for, which is to praise God and to be a holy place. So he's flipping over tables, all these kind of things. So there is this thing called righteous anger. But as we'll get through the show, I, I, I have had some righteous anger and I've had some not so righteous anger in my time. But as I was going through this, I was just welling up with rage and so angry at Timothy McVeigh for this bombing. And it was interesting because I was connecting it with 9-11 because I remember 9-11 and I remember being very much saddened by 9-11. It's two very different reactions to it. 9-11, I remember being sad and afraid, which we talked about last week. And I remember like being at the, they were building the 9-11 memorial when I went to go visit New York City when I was in college. And I remember just being overwhelmingly sad. So as I was, as we were going to this memorial, as I was watching this video, I was like, why am I so angry? And I realized the big difference was because there were kids involved. There's something that actually is good inside. I mean, we'll talk a little bit about sometimes that that can be, be overrun and used not for good. But there's this part of me that I know is intrinsically part of me of being a protector. That I want to protect the people that I'm around. I want to protect my my family. I want to protect my kids. I want to protect my wife. I've always been like that. Even in high school, I always wanted to protect my friends. The first fight I ever got into was when I was in middle school, sixth grade. And one of my friends is just over in the corner, just getting beat up, beat up, beat up, beat up. 
So I sprint over there. I tackle the kid that was fighting my friend. I tackle him, and I'm a lot bigger than this kid. And then he bucks up to me, and he's, like, trying to fight me. And I, like, I push him. I just push him once, and he falls down. And at this point, like, all the, all the uh, like, teachers are running out to us and stuff. We go into the uh, principal's office or the counselor's office. And both, like, my friend and this guy got in trouble. And the counselor told me, thank you. Because essentially I just broke up this fight and they didn't really like the brat that was causing this trouble. So they kind of thanked me. But I've always had that in me that I, I want to protect. And I, I do have this like righteous anger when I see something that I don't like. And I, I just completely felt it welling up in me. As we're, as we're walking through this memorial, I start learning things about the, the attack. That actually before 9-11, this was the largest terrorist attack on American soil that has ever happened. And still to this day, it's the largest one, a largest domestic terrorist attack because the terrorist attack on 9-11 obviously was from people over in the Middle East. But this is the largest terror attack that's ever happened from somebody who was an American. So we get to the entrance of the memorial. I'm already kind of angry and upset after, after watching this video uh, here, in, here in the parents' screen, the, the loss of these lives. So we walk in, and the entrance is really cool. And on the entrance to this, to this memorial, it says this. We come here to remember those who were killed, those who survived, and those changed forever. May all who leave here know the impact of violence. May this memorial offer comfort, strength, peace, hope, and serenity. So I read that as I was going in, and it actually says it on both sides. So essentially what this is, is that it's a a block, like a, a city block that has been completely blocked off now and made into this memorial. And on where the street used to be is now this like, you know, infinity pool where essentially it's this pool of water that the water is continually running. And that's where the street was. So you're walking around this and these two big black entrances on either side, probably 20, 30 feet, if I was guessing. And that's what it says on the top of this. And I remember reading it not as I walked in, I actually didn't see it because it's so high that we walked across the street and I was just looking like at eye level and I didn't look up. So I walk through the memorial and one of the biggest things that I see is these chairs that are set up. So if there's like the city block that's now water and then there's a tree on one side, we'll get to that in a second. And then on the right side where I walked in, there's all these golden chairs. And a lot of them are like, you know, chairs big enough to seat an adult but then i saw these like little tiny chairs and those were for the kids that had passed away in this bombing and this whole time like you'd think just like how i reacted to 9-11 or how i react to a lot of these national tragedies you'd think i'd be sad i was just so angry not to the point of shaking but like my heart rate was racing and i was just kind of clenching my fists and i didn't want to talk to anybody because i was just so 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 mad that timothy mcveigh went to go commit this tragedy commit this horror and so as I'm walking around, I'm still feeling this and kind of wrestling with this. And I'm like, okay, I know that we're here to like witness this. And I know that we're going to pray about it, but I'm really just like not in this place where I want to pray. I'm just, I'm just angry. So we continue walking through. And as I'm angry and kind of learning more about this, I'm hearing little things about the memorial. So on one side, like I told you, there's these two big black entrances on either side. On one, it's on the inside, it says like a time, 901. So obviously I didn't know what that meant, but then some of the local people who were there that were kind of showing us around said that, okay, like the bombing happened at 9.02 in the morning. So 9.01 is the time on one side, and then there's the whole place where the bombing happened. And 9.01 was like the moment of peace before anything happened, where it was just everybody going about their normal day. 9.02, all this destruction happened, and that's where you're walking in the memorial. The lives that were lost, you're walking where the building used to be. And then the other side says 9.03. And why that time is there is because what they said is like, that's the moment that healings began, which, which, is, which is crazy, crazy, crazy to think about, right? Because if you think about what was happening at 903, there were people fleeing the building. There were people still figuring out what was going on. It rocked the whole like downtown of Oklahoma City. Like it wasn't just this building that happened. Within a 16 block radius, glass shattered. There's, there's a Catholic church across the street. The rectory just like, exploded like it was just it was just done for 
uh, cars were just burning and like it, it's crazy because this is like where we were hanging out so like that evening we went to the memorial like before we went to the memorial we went to dinner so if three or four blocks away we went to this really nice restaurant like that place would have been affected uh we went to the memorial then we went to this church and that that church was affected and then we went down the road to this bar after we went because we were hanging out and meeting friends and all that kind of stuff like that place like I, we were talking to some people that were locals there we were like oh yeah we're from out of town and we were here visiting the memorial and they were like oh yeah like this place was highly affected and, and like glass burned out and, and fired like all this crazy 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 stuff we were there like for this catholic leadership thing so obviously we wanted to take some time to pray so what we do is we go up to this tree this tree was standing there during the bombing and it stayed standing and it's still this big old beautiful huge tree and in the description of it at the memorial it says that the deep roots of this the deep roots of our faith is what will keep us standing so we were like okay let's go up there we'll do some praise and worship i brought my guitar and we started doing praise and worship we you know sang about three three or four songs and as we're as we're walking up to do that I'm still angry. I'm supposed to be like leading worship in this time of peace, this time of praise of God in the midst of this, this tragedy, this suffering. And still I'm angry. And I, we walk up and there's graffiti written on the wall right next to the tree. And it says from team five. So this was written. I found this out. This was written by one of the rescue teams, one of the people going in on that date for 1995. We search for the truth. We seek justice. The courts require it, the victims cry for it, and God demands it. As I'm struggling with this anger welling up inside of me, I'm like, I'm not obviously not the only one who's feeling this. Like, I could totally resonate with this graffiti that was on the wall written by this group of people who were there, who were doing everything that they could to continue to help the people who who weren't killed and and to, to help those who were still in danger. And so I think this, this searching for justice is something that is, dwells within us as Christians, as Catholics. It says the courts require it, because at this time they, they still hadn't found Timothy McVeigh and all the other people that were involved. The courts require it, the victims cry for it. And immediately as I heard that, I think of the Cain and Abel story from the Old Testament. Like the, you know, the, Adam and Eve were the first sin, and then you know, siblings happened pretty close to that, and then a lot of sins started happening, because that's what happens when you have siblings. Cain kills Abel. Abel, the, the just brother, he kills him. And it says that in the scriptures that, that Abel's blood cries out to God as it soaked into the earth. It cried out to God saying, like, justice is required. Vengeance is required. It says, and God demands it, which is a really interesting thing. Because a lot of times, and we talk a lot of times about God being merciful, which he is, but he's this perfect blend of mercy and justice. I love this verse, and I always th- say that it's God is the first Avenger. I love the Avengers films. In Romans chapter 12, verse 19, it's talking to us. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, and this is a quote from God, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. That's the end of the quote. So I'm sitting here struggling with this and wrestling with this and trying to figure out what's going on. And this whole time I'm reminded of God has the same desire that I do for justice. He has the same desire that I do to keep his children safe. And so I I just thinking there's a statue right across the street at the Catholic church, literally right across the street from the memorial where this happened. And it's a statue of Jesus weeping. There's that that famous passage where, where Jesus wept and he's turned away and he's got his hands in his face. And I just stared into his face at the end of this time of prayer and just wrestled with it. And we met up as a group. And I think the biggest thing that helped me is that I felt so, I felt so helpless. You know, I was five when this happened. There's nothing that I could have possibly done about it. And I'm sitting here thinking about these kids that died and thinking of the, the faces of my two children and how angry I would be if something happened to them like this. And then I'm just reminded that there is some righteous anger, but at the same time, I need to continue giving these things to God. I don't need to have this anger welling up inside of me and that God's going to, God can take care of it. Justice did come for this guy. And actually, uh, we're going to keep this conversation going throughout the rest of the show. Right when we come back, we're going to be talking to a professor about the death penalty. Because um, Timothy McVeigh, who, who was the bomber at the Oklahoma City bombing, 
did receive the death penalty. We're going to talk about what the Catholic Church actually says about the death penalty, and we'll keep this conversation going. This is Forte Catholic with Taylor Schroll. Welcome back to Forte Catholic Radio. This is your host, Taylor Schroll. If you're just joining us and you're new to the show, our second segment is always our interview segment. Uh, Our first segment, we were talking about the Oklahoma City bombing. I just visited the memorial last week. And we have a perfect guest to talk about this subject of this tragedy and the death penalty in uh, Professor Edward Fazer. Professor Ed, how are you doing this evening, sir? I'm doing very well, thank you. Good. I'm so happy to have you on. And it's it's so interesting how God works because I'm interested in the death penalty and, and in this book that you have that we're going to get into. But I had no idea whenever you got booked to come on the show a few weeks ago that I was going to be going to Oklahoma City last week. I had absolutely no idea. So then to have these two things kind of collide is totally God because I was telling them in the, in the last segment, I was just so angry when I was at the when I was at the memorial, just out of this demand for justice, and so I can yeah. I, I can totally I can totally see the connections there between you know the anger that caused Timothy McVeigh to to commit this crime, and then also the the righteous anger and the death penalty and these kinds of things. So I think it's a thing that we all need to wrestle with. But um, why don't we just let you introduce yourself a little bit before we dive into the topic? Who are you and what do you do? Sure. Uh, so my name's uh, Edward Fazer. I'm a professor of philosophy at Pasadena City College in the Los Angeles area here in uh, California. And I'm also a writer. And I've actually got two books out very recently. One of them is the one you referred to by Man Shall His Blood Be Shed, A Catholic Defense of Capital Punishment, which I co-authored with Joseph Bissett, who um, is a friend of mine and a political scientist at Claremont McKenna College, also out here in the, uh, the L.A. area. And also, in, that's from Ignatius Press, very prominent Catholic publisher. And Ignatius has also just, in the last few weeks, put out another book of mine, Five Proofs of the Existence of God. Very different subject matter, so I write on quite a number of topics. And I've got a blog and a website, edwardfazer.com, where you can find a link to the blog for anyone who wants to find out more about, uh, more about my work and my books and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I was checking you out before you came onto the show. I've enjoyed some of your blog posts, and I've been looking forward to talking to you about the death penalty, because as you say in the description of this book, By a Man Shall His Blood Be Shed, the Catholic Church has in recent decades been associated with political efforts to eliminate the death penalty. And I can totally connect with this, because when I was in college, I went to a, a Catholic university, and there was a group there that were like, hey, you're part of the campus ministry, why don't you join us in this like anti-death <clears throat> penalty group? And I was like, well, yes, but... Maybe not, and I had some very interesting conversations with them. Your, what your book is trying to do is say what the Catholic Church actually teaches about the death penalty. Why don't you give us the intro to that, and what does the Church actually teach? Yeah, maybe a, a, an interesting way to uh, to preface the discussion is, you know, you mentioned how when you were in college, um, fellow Catholics would present uh, opposition to capital punishment as if it were the Catholic position. And my co-author, Joe Bissett, um, who's in his 60s, um, he likes to point out that when he was in college, uh, because he's heard the same thing from his students, he he says, you hear students say things like, well, I'm Catholic, so naturally I'm against capital punishment. He says, the weird thing is that when when he was in college, people would have said, well, I'm Catholic, so naturally I'm in favor of capital punishment. Oh, wow. That shows how, how dramatic attitudes have shifted in just a few decades. And traditionally, the, the, the Church has certainly always allowed support for capital punishment to be something that uh, a Catholic in good standing could, could, uh, could certainly uh, endorse. And the Church still endorses that position. Um, and so probably a good way to introduce our discussion is with a quote that we, we actually open the book with from Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger in 2004. And of course, he went on to become Pope Benedict XVI. But at the time, he was Pope John Paul II's chief doctrinal officer, the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And in 2004, he explicitly addressed this question of capital punishment um, in a memorandum issued during this election year. And he said that, and here I'm going <clears> to <throat> quote as far as I can from memory his exact words, he said that, quote, there may be a legitimate diversity of opinion even among Catholics about capital punishment, 
And he explicitly contrasted this with abortion euthanasia, where he said there cannot be any legitimate diversity of opinion. Every Catholic has to be against abortion euthanasia. But uh, on capital punishment, there could be what he called a, diver- a legitimate diversity of opinion. And he even went so far as to say in the very, say, the very same statement that a Catholic could be, quote, at odds with the Holy Father, unquote, on the subject of capital punishment and still be worthy to present himself for Holy Communion. And again, he contrasted this with support for abortion euthanasia, which would make someone unworthy of receipt of Holy Communion. So um, what he was doing there was simply reaffirming the traditional teaching of the Church that capital punishment is not intrinsically immoral. And and when people lump capital punishment in together with abortion and euthanasia, as if you have to be be opposed to all of them if you're going to respect life and so forth, they're really... Uh, overlooking and ignoring a crucial theological and moral distinction between the innocent and the guilty, between innocent life and guilty life. It's always wrong intentionally to take innocent life, as, as, as happens in abortion euthanasia. But those who are executed for very serious crimes, like murder, they've, as Pope Pius XII in the, in the, in the 1940s, I think it was, put it, um, the person guilty of a grave offense like that has forfeited his right to life by virtue of committing that act. And so um, it's not intrinsically wrong to execute uh, an offender. Whether we ought to go ahead and do that, whether the state ought to go ahead and and and, and exercise that right to to punish offenders with capital punishment, that's what's called in Catholic circles a prudential judgment rather than a matter of theological principle. And it's something about which Catholics are free to disagree. Yeah, that, that's really interesting because a lot of the arguments that I've heard against the the death penalty are that like you know all like we we value all life from from natural birth until natural or you know from conception until natural death, and that people try to try to use that to say oh death penalty is wrong in all circumstances. Yeah. So um, right, what in the like you know like as you guys are. Um, defending like the traditional Catholic Church's teaching, what are the reasons why somebody would use the death penalty according to the traditional Catholic Church's teachings? Well, uh, according to traditional Catholic teaching, any punishment, whether it is capital punishment or some lesser punishment, when the government decides whether or not to inflict a punishment, it has to consider how well uh, application of the punishment would help to realize the ends or goals of punishment. And traditionally, the Church and the natural law approach to to moral philosophy that the Church has always endorsed um, have recognized several purposes of punishment. The primary purpose of punishment is what's called retributive justice, is inflicting on an offender a punishment that's proportional to the nature of the offense. That's why we, we wouldn't punish, say, kidnapping with a small fine of $20, right? Because that would be way out of proportion to the seriousness of that offense. If, if someone's a kidnapper or a bank robber, we have to make sure that the punishment is, is sufficiently grave. It's sufficiently serious a punishment. It has to correspond to the gravity of the offense. Um, so that's one of the ends of punishment that any punishment, whether it's capital punishment or otherwise, has to respect. And the, the current catechism of the Catholic Church reaffirms this traditional teaching when it says that, quote, the primary end of punishment is to redress the disorder caused by the offense. It's talking about, you might say, setting right the moral balance, the, the moral imbalance that the crime has introduced into, into the world. A second purpose of punishment that uh, the Church recognizes is deterrence deterring others from committing a a similar crime. A third would be the rehabilitation of the offender, promoting the offender's repentance, leading him to repent and get himself right with God and make himself a good member of society. As well as a fourth purpose would be protecting society against further harm. Okay, so when we consider any punishment, we have to ask whether it realizes all of these purposes of punishment. And what we are, among the many things we argue in the book, is that capital punishment, at least for some crimes, at least for the most serious crimes, is really the best way to realize all the purposes of punishment. For some crimes, they're so serious that nothing less than capital punishment would be proportionate. Nothing less than capital punishment would be serious enough to send a signal, as it were, about how badly the offender has violated the moral law and the social order. We also argue that capital punishment does have a significant deterrent effect. And we examine the social scientific evidence for that claim. 
We also argue, and this might seem to be surprising to some people, but we argue that capital punishment also promotes the goal of punishment that has to do with rehabilitation or repentance. A lot of people say, well, if you execute an offender, even if he deserves it, then you're really cutting off the possibility of his repenting and getting himself right with God. But St. Thomas Aquinas, um, who ever, any Catholic has to take seriously his opinion on this matter, he actually considers that objection, and he calls it frivolous. That's his exact word. He says the frivolous objection. And the reason he says is that if the prospect of dying, if the prospect of losing his life doesn't move a criminal to repent, to get himself right with God when he knows that he's going to die very soon, he says that it's very likely nothing else would, would lead him to repent. So knowing, an offender knowing that he's, that he's going to be executed, that he has a very short time to get his, right, his soul right with God, often that can actually prompt repentance. And we have evidence in the book, we provide lots of evidence in the book, of cases where many uh, offenders on death row have converted, have repented, and some of them have said that they wouldn't have done so had they not known that they were going to, that they were going to die, that they were going to meet their maker, and that they had to accept this as the punishment that was justly deserved. And that, and that often can be taken as, by an offender as part of, his, um, part of his restitution for his crime, showing that he's truly repentant, is accepting the punishment that he's merited. That's really interesting. I had never heard that that uh, St. Thomas Aquinas quote before. And it, for a moment, it, it doesn't happen often on this show. But for a moment, I felt kind of smart. But, but because before you even said the like the impending death thing, I was immediately thinking like, oh yeah, like people have whenever the people know they're going to die, they get right with God. It's kind of a joke most of the time. But when it actually is happening, like people are really that's their chance. It's like if you've ever heard of God, you heard of heaven and hell. That's your chance to do it. And here in America, there's plenty of time between the crime and the and the death penalty because they go through courts and they go through appeals and they go through all this kind of stuff. So that that totally makes sense. As, as you were talking both about the impending death and all the things that y'all are arguing for, I, I want to be able to know um, how to uh, how to um, I guess talk to this one. I guess the one big thing that people would push back on. Um, that I, that I've experienced yeah. as well of why not why not life in prison um it's you know like even for I've heard it for social reasons it's a lot cheaper to actually keep them alive like financially at least here in Texas I'm not sure about California um but also like why can't why can't justice be done that way what would what would you say what would the church say um to an argument yeah. like that like where we shouldn't have it here in America right right well, there are a number of considerations that we develop in the book, and one of them, maybe the most fundamental, is that because of this fundamental principle that the Church has always uh, affirmed, that a punishment has to be proportional to the offense, that it's a—you might say it's, a, it's an offense against justice if, in general, people get less what they, than what they deserve. Now, it doesn't mean we always have to inflict on someone exactly what he deserves. We may have moral reasons for refraining from doing so, but in general— the principle that the punishment ought to fit the crime is one that the justice system has to respect. So what happens, given that principle, is that if we, we set up the justice system in such a way that no matter what someone does, if he not only commits murder, but he commits multiple murders, he commits serial murders, he, you know, he cannibalizes his victims the way Jeffrey Dahmer did, or he rapes and tortures his victims or what have you. If no matter what someone does, no matter how horrific the crime he never gets anything worse than life imprisonment. He never gets anything worse than uh, the guy who just kills one person without all these sadistic elements added to the crime. Then we lose all sense of the moral balances, you might say, between the nature of the offense and the nature of the crime. We lose an understanding, a visceral understanding of this idea that the punishment ought to fit the crime. So to, to uphold the general sense and acknowledgement of justice in society, and that there is a an objective moral order that requires that offenders have to be have to suffer a penalty that's proportionate to their offense. We argue that we we need to keep capital punishment on the books and something that's applied at least in the in the worst crimes. So that that's in the case of the worst crimes. That's that's one point. Another point is that among the various ways we talk about in which capital punishment has a deterrent effect, uh, there's the consideration that. You have, for example, sometimes offenders in prison who are not deterred from killing precisely because they've already got the maximum penalty. So suppose, for example, that someone is in prison for murder 
And so he's and he's got the worst penalty he gets is life imprisonment, say, without the possibility of parole. Right. Suppose for whatever reason, while he's in prison, he ha- he's um, he has some motive to kill a fellow prisoner. Or let's say he has a motive if he's a mobster to call in a hit on someone outside of prison. Well, if he's already got the worst penalty he can get, namely life in prison, he's got no motivation. He's got no deterrent not to go ahead and order that murder or commit that murder of his fellow inmate. Whereas if he knows that that he faces that, then he has that extra deterrent from doing that. He has that extra reason or motivation not to do that. There are also cases where if someone's in the course of committing a crime, forget about the context of when they're already in prison, say, but he's not, someone's not in prison, say, and suppose he's committing an armed robbery or he's committing a kidnapping or some other crime like that, and he's in a state where he knows that the worst penalty he could get is life in prison, that he's not eligible for the death penalty, then there's no reason for him not to go ahead and kill his victim, say, if he thinks the victim might turn him in or if for some other reason he thinks he'll get out of he'll get something out of killing the victim whereas if he's in a death penalty state and he knows that he might uh, face capital punishment if he kills the person he has a reason not to do that he has a reason not to go that extra step go you know go to that next level and commit that more serious crime and we discuss evidence in the book that some criminals have been motivated precisely by that consideration not to go ahead and and um uh, and kill people in the course of their crime because they knew they were in a death penalty state, um, and uh, they knew therefore they'd face capital punishment. Or, they, or in some cases, they're sure to cross state lines and go and commit their crimes in a state where they don't have capital punishment because then they know that whatever happens if they have to kill someone in the course of their crime, they won't face that ultimate penalty. So those are just some of the ways in which we argue that capital punishment is necessary to keep on the books for its deterrent, its, its deterrence value. This is all it's all super intriguing to me, especially living in Texas. You know, like as a kid, I was I was told, you know, death penalty is always right and you have to do it and all these kind of things. And then like I, it has been something I've been wrestling with um, throughout the time that I've been growing in my faith and trying to figure out like what, you know, what the church really teaches. And I think your book will, will definitely help. Um, so we're talking with Professor Edward Fazer about his 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 book um, from Ignatius Press. Uh, by Man Shall His Blood Be Shed, A Catholic Defense of Capital Punishment. He co-wrote it with Joseph Bissett. Uh, where can people find the book, Edward, as we as we wrap up our time today? Uh, you can find the book in the finer bookstores. Uh, I've seen it in Barnes & Noble, for example. Naturally, you can also get it on Amazon.com. Uh, and you can also get it straight from the publisher's website, Ignatius Press. It's available in print. It's also available on Kindle or on other electronic versions for people who prefer that. Well, great. I think people will really enjoy it and be able to wrestle with these topics and hear what you guys have to say. Also, check out Ed- Edward's uh, website, edwardfaser, F-E-S-E-R dot com. Thanks a lot, Professor. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we are back for our final segment of Forte Catholic for the evening. I want to thank Ed, Mr. Edward Fazer again for coming on to the show and talking about the death penalty. I think it's one of those things that, especially here in Texas, is a, is a point of controversy. It's a point where people really um, assume what the church teaches, and I think we all need to get into it and wrestle with it. You know it's a good interview when we keep the conversation going in uh, off the air, so we can... we continued having a conversation like this is what I think this is what I think and this is what we thought of the interview so I think it's a really intriguing topic so check out that book and then let me know what you think about that so we're going to keep this conversation going about about anger because a lot of times anger leads people to commit these crimes that is that is facing them with the death penalty I talked in the first segment about the anger that I had um, in when I went to go visit the Oklahoma City bombing memorial and there's like this just this need and desire for justice that kept welling up inside of me, which is just so interesting because, yeah, there is a difference between like regular anger, like wrath and righteous anger. But at the same time, like I don't want to react in anger whenever the crime was committed in anger. Because we were talking about the Oklahoma City bombing and how uh, Timothy McVeigh went in because he was angry at the government. He blew up this building because he was angry at the gum at the government. Um, we live not too far from Waco. He was angry about how the the government uh, dealt with that Waco, the crazy church people that were in there, and they shot him all or whatever. It's it's just 
very odd. He was mad about that. He was a, he was a veteran. He was mad, mad at the government, probably had some PTSD type stuff going on too. And he was angry and he wanted, he wanted to inflict the most pain. And so, so what he did is he went to, like he found, he went and parked the bus where he knew the nursery was. Because he wanted to inflict the most pain. It's just like, I'm like, like that made me so, so, so very angry. And we were meeting about it as a group after. Right in front of the statue that I was telling y'all about earlier, the Jesus wept statue right across the street where it shows Jesus weeping. And like after we go through memorial, oh, I have to tell you one thing that, that made me extra angry. So we go pray in front of this tree when we're leading worship and the security guard comes over and he's like, get out. And we're like, he's talking to Jim Beckman, our leader. He's like, y'all need to leave. It's like, and then we were just like confused. It's like, isn't this a public place? And they're like, no, it's a private place. It's a 501 C3. So it's like a, some private person or company owns it, right? So we're like, okay, like that's that's fine. And like we we would even want like we had wondered before, like, is it okay to do this? Because like it's kind of a quiet and somber place. So like make a noise. So what we did is like we went up to the tree, which is kind of off the off the way. And it was it was getting dark. It was probably, I don't know, eight thirty, nine o'clock at night, something like that. And there were like literally two other people in the memorial at this point. So even if the rule is like, you can't do this to play music, like the guy came over and was like, he started getting really angry. It's like, y'all need to leave like right now. So I'm, I'm sitting over here. I noticed none of this because I'm leading worship. I got my eyes closed. I'm all into the prayer, right? Like struggling, like trying to just praise God because I'm so angry, right? And then I just hear Taylor. I'm like, God? And like, no, it was Jim Beckman. He was like, Taylor, stop. <laughs> oh, okay. So I did. And then he tells us this story. Like the guy was just, Something like, y'all need to leave. It's like, oh, like, can we like stand here and, and, and stay and like pray and, and talk like quietly? It's like, no, y'all need to leave. It's like, well, that's stupid, right? So like then then like a lot of our group is mad at that. I'm like, I can't get any angrier, so I'm fine. You know, like my anger cap is already all the way at the top. <clears throat> so we go, we go over to the to the Jesus Wept statue and we have like this group conversation about like, okay, what are you feeling? And I'm kind of holding back because I'm surrounded by these super like holy Catholic people. And of course, like they give like the really holy answers like, oh, I'm very, you know, I'm saddened by this. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, trying to, trying to pray through it and trying to figure out like my, my emotions and my feelings. And then like everybody else talks and I'm just like, I'm angry, you know, and I share a lot of the stuff that I've been sharing here on the night, uh, on the show tonight. I just about how mad I was. And I was just like, I don't, I don't have an answer. It's not like I was praying and an answer came and God was like, yes, it is all fine now. You know, even like some of the scriptures I've shared tonight, like the, like the, the, the first scripture I, sh- I shared in the, in the first segment from Romans, like telling us do not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. And it's like, I know that Timothy McVeigh is dead. He got the death penalty. Like I, all I wanted to do in that time was kill him. And it's like, I'm sitting here wrestling with this is like, is this anger? Is it righteous anger? Is it both? Like, I don't know. And I'm sitting here wrestling with all these things in a very real and, and like tangible way. As I'm, you know, I said earlier, walk around almost shaking and, and just can't, don't want to talk, talk to anybody. Don't want to be around everybody. And then I, I still just can't figure it out. And I'm like, actually kind of mad. I'm mad at myself. I'm mad at Timothy Vey. I'm mad at the, the people that let this happen. I'm mad that there wasn't something in place to like, see that he was coming into this thing. Like all the security things that we have now in response to this bombing in response to nine 11, like we are a lot safer now. And then I was mad. It's like, I, why couldn't I be there? And then I was mad about like, you know, what if this happened to my kids? Like things that aren't even real at this point, right? What if this happened to my kids? And then somebody in our group, we're there as a, as a group of people in ministry. Half of us were youth ministers. The other half were like DREs or working in the diocese. And it was what, what this one lady said. She just started crying because she was so sad. And she was like, all I could think about was, because Timothy McVeigh was Catholic. He was confirmed Catholic. And all she could think about was like, what would have happened if somebody would have like really reached him with the gospel? really reached him with the good news. Now, granted, there was like this PTSD, like some psychological things going on. But what would have happened if the church would have served him better? And then Jim kind of said something very similar. He was saying, you know, think about how times have changed from now 
like to now from 1995. Like in 1995, like we could, I think we can all agree that the ethics of our country were a little bit higher than they are now. And this kind of tragedy happened. The major tragedy happened once. It's like, what? Look at what's going on now. Like, our world's just crazy. And I was sitting there like, why? Like, I just feeling helpless. I couldn't do anything about this. I, I just want to protect. And I can't do anything about it. And then both of them said, what, what can we do? We can't do anything about what happened in 1995 in Oklahoma City. I can do nothing about that. But what we can do is continue bringing the good news of the gospel to people, to young people, to adults, to whoever in the church, like wherever you're called to do it with your friends, with your neighbors, with your family, with whoever. Because obviously Timothy McVeigh was angry and he was hurting. And he took that out on these, on these to him, random people. All they were were just government officials. He didn't hate specifically anybody in that building. He just hated the U.S. government. And he found the place where he could inflict the most pain on the U.S. government and on the United States. What if he would have gotten some help? What if even in the midst of his hurting and his pain and his PTSD and his psychological things, what if in the mix of that, he got some real help and somebody would have brought in the joy of the gospel to him? Like, would it have happened? Like, the answer, I mean, the real answer is we don't know. But I do know that when real things are, are, are going wrong in the lives of people, having God in your corner is definitely helpful. Even in the midst of real struggles and real trials and real anger, like having God there can help you. And I, th- I think I, I, was, I was looking at myself for this last segment. And there, I was, I was thinking about it because in the last week, there's somebody who prominent who works in the church. I heard him say, uh, tell this story about a time that they had with their son. Prominent church, church official, you know, a lot of people look up to this person and uh, their son walks up to him and is just like angry and about to cry in how this person is, is just angry at home and yelling at, at, at the kids and yelling at, at whoever and snapping at the wife and all these kinds of things. And the kid pulls him aside and says, if you wouldn't treat somebody like that at work, why do you do it at home? And instantly as I heard this story, I was like, well, well crap, you know? I, I, my kids, if they had a, vocabulary more than a four and a two-year-old might be able to say something very similar or my wife or any of these kind of things. It's not like I'm hitting people or whatever. I don't want to put, just to be clear. But if I get angry at somebody at work, most of the time I'm able to handle it better than if I get frustrated. It's easier to snap at my kids or yell at my kids. It's easier to snap at my wife and be grumpy than it is at work. Now, granted, I'm sitting in here with two people that I work with and I've, I've done that at work. But the percentage of times that I do it is a lot higher at home than it is at work. And anger has anger has has been a thing that's that's been a part of my life. And I don't even know why. I've had a fairly decent life. I like life. It's it's a fun thing. It's it's better than the alternative for sure. Uh, But in high school, especially around sports, I think it was a testosterone thing. And I used to work out for like nine hours a day. I'm sure that was helpful. But especially like in basketball and in football, like, man, you did not want to get in my way. And people would start talking trash and I talk trash back and I start pushing and all this kind of stuff. It starts in high school and it gets really bad my freshman year in college. I think I was angry because like I had gotten hurt. And I've talked before about if I'm suffering like in my body, it's not good for the people around me. And I, I was I was running track, and, and that was kind of frustrating because I had blown out my hamstring, and I was working hard, and I, well, I wasn't getting any faster. All, all this kind of backstory that you don't really need to care about because you don't. Um, but I was playing basketball with this group of guys, and I was in campus ministry, and I was kind of becoming this leader at this Catholic school. And so I'd be playing basketball with this group of Catholic guys, 
and I'd start talking trash and I'd start pushing and I'd start, you know, somebody would hit me and I'd like swing my elbow back at him and, or I'd start yelling at him or storm out or like well, all these stupid young guy stuff. And it was happening very, very, very often. And then finally somebody came up to me, uh, uh, somebody who kind of mentored me and helped me through this, an older guy. I think he was a senior or junior at the time in college. He's like, uh, you know, that's not how Christians act. Right. And I was like, well, dang it. <laughs> you know, like, would you do a, a similar question? Would you do this in church? Uh, no, <laughs> I'd get kicked out and uh, excommunicated. But yet I was doing it around the same group of people that I went to church with. And like, he didn't, he didn't help me by sitting me down and throwing scriptures at me and and scolding me. All he did was like, hey, he brought it to my attention. He opened my eyes. He's like, you, you know this isn't right. And I did. I didn't have to be taught, yeah, you shouldn't yell at people. You shouldn't push people over. It's like, that's, I, I've known that since kindergarten. But yet, <laughs> I hadn't applied it to my life, right? So what this guy did is he mentored me and he walked with me through it. We still played basketball together. By the end of that freshman year, I had gotten to the point where I wasn't lashing out in anger anymore on the court. I was a lot calmer. I was a lot more, more, more cool, calm, and collected, as I like to say in the sports world. And it was all because, number one, this guy called me out, and then he walked with me on it. Because I'd slip up, and I'd start getting angry, and he like kind of saw the warning signs, and he'd be like, hey, calm down. And I'd be like, so, like, I mean, people would, there were some jerks that played basketball out there with us. Like it was like a group of friends, but there was also some other, you know, just random other people that would come and play at the rec center at this college. And they would talk trash and they would hit like, so people like there was one night where there was this guy that literally was swinging elbows at me. And all I naturally wanted to do was start swinging my fist back at him. But because this guy had been walking with, walking with me through this and he was there, I was able to be like, okay, I need to calm down. And then I started reacting in a very fun way. I started saying nothing. And I got really, really honed into the game of basketball. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I'm going to be the strong, silent type here for about a year. Because I know if I open my mouth, then I'll start swinging my hands. <laughs> and that's not good. So I, I had this this big time of of being trained in this. And I think when we all want to grow in virtue, there's a, so we we hear about virtue. What is what is what is this human virtue? The whole purpose of growing in virtue is that we we gain self knowledge. That's the first step. Self knowledge of yeah, I'm not very good in my initial reaction when I'm angry. That self knowledge came through somebody who's not myself, <laughs> through somebody who was able to walk with me. The whole purpose of self-knowledge is that you, you can uh, then go into self-mastery. Self-mastery, what this means is like I'm mastering myself. Now, that seems like a dumb way to explain that, right? But myself naturally, for whatever reason, wants to react to anger in a bad way. So I have to overcome myself so that I can become a self-gift. So I have to get all these rough edges like like off of me and I have to have help the help of God. But in a very human way, I need to have somebody that can 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 help me in this. We've talked about spiritual direction before. We've talked about uh surrounding yourself with good friends before. Cuz even as I, as I I talk about this now, like anger's not gone from my life. I still snap at people at home, I snap at people at work, I've snapped at people on this radio show. Like anger's still there, but it's these moments like going to the Oklahoma City bombing memorial that remind me that this is a uh, this is part of me that is not completely refined and given to the Lord. So it makes it's it's something in me that I still need to self master with the help of God, so that I can so that I can be a better gift to you people listening to the show, to people that I work with, to my kids, to my wife, to my friends, to all of these things. If I if I continue to react in anger, it's not going to be good for those around me and therefore it's not going to be good for me and it, it's just like however you want to look at it, it's not good. 
And so over the course of this last week, I've just had to I've just had to pray with it. And I've had to like I just looked at script, you know, I typed in scriptures about anger in Google. As I did that, preparing for this show, the internet didn't work and I got very angry. And then I just laughed at the irony of it. It's like, Taylor, you're stupid. Remember to continue to pour yourself in with the scriptures. Don't go to sleep with anger. Forgive the people that you're angry with. And let's move forward to continue to grow with each other and continue to help each other out. It's been another episode of Forte Catholic. It's been a lot of fun. Be back next week. See you.